Okay, she plugged the information from all the things you've been doing. All right, thanks everyone for coming tonight. We're gonna to call this meeting to order. And uh, I'll ask us to all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mrs. Sugars, would you do roll call please? Mrs. Arroyo? Here. Mrs. Stratton? Here. Mrs. Fleischer? Here. Ms. Friedel? Here. Dr. Rude? Here. Ms. Stern? Here. Mrs. Tong? Here. Mr. Avadia? Here. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Malash to introduce uh, our presentation for this evening. Thank you, Mr. Avadia, uh, and thank you to the board and the members of the community. Um, I'll do a little early thank you to our other presenters who are with us this evening for joining us for this special board meeting. Now, uh, this is a unique board meeting for us in Cherry Hill, uh, as it is um, not the second or the fourth Tuesday of the month. We are at the third Tuesday of the month, but we wanted to have this special meeting. The board decided back in the fall to have this meeting specifically to talk about the formulation of the bond referendum. Uh, we wanted to make sure that everybody in the community could focus on just this one topic. So I really appreciate the, the board's determination in having this uh, and the folks that are here with us in person and those of you who are online um, to participate. So Mrs. Wilson, if you would pull up the initial presentation. Um, we have two presentations we're going to deliver tonight. The first one, Mrs. Wilson and Mrs. Sugars and I will kind of go through and just talk a little bit about um, community input and the history of where uh, we have been over the last couple of years and what, is, what has brought us to this evening. Then the actual, the more exciting part of the evening um, is when Mr. Garrison, Mr. Salamini, um, uh, oh my goodness, last name, right out of my brain, uh, Mr. Notley and, and Tracy uh, will be delivering a presentation on projects and the specifics about different tiers uh, and levels of, pre, of uh, projects for the district. 
So thank you all for being here. There will be a public comment section uh, that will come up after the presentations are completed uh, and after the board has had time to discuss and ask questions of the professionals as well. So this first little introduction piece is just Cherry Hill Public Schools, the building improvement plans and the community input. One of the things that we have known, and Ms. Wilson, you can go on to, uh, to the next slide. One of the things that we have known since we had the initial referendum, we had the referendum back in December of 2018, uh, as we had lots of discussion, was that we needed more community input leading up to and throughout the entire process. Uh, and this takes us back to that, that December date back in 2018, uh, when we put a referendum out to vote and the referendum was voted down. Uh, it was constructed of three different questions. All three questions failed in the public vote. And right after that, when it went down, because we knew that there were, at that point, we had identified a little more than $200 million worth of projects. We knew there was work that desperately needed to be done within this district. There were infrastructure items, things that had to be taken care of. So again, as we started to talk with folks about why did the referendum fail? What do we need to do differently as we progress and move forward? Because we know this is going to have to take place. How can we have people better engaged? How can we have a better pulse of what's going on within the community? So through February and March of 2019, there were five public forums that were held. Uh, parents, residents without children in Cherry Hill Public Schools, Cherry Hill Public Schools staff were surveyed. Uh, we ended up with thousands of data points and putting information out to survey the community. There was an ad hoc committee that was formed to review input and to make recommendations for the next board steps. We brought in a facilitator, uh, Judy Wilson. Mrs. Judy Wilson came in and worked with our ad hoc committee. And the ad hoc committee was made up of people from across the community. There were board members, there were administrators, uh, there were staff, there were families, there were people again without children in the district, people who had supported the referendum in December of 2018 and people who had campaigned against the referendum all came together with the knowledge and the understanding that something needed to take place within our district. And from April of 2020 through um, January of 2021, we had school building improvement updates uh, that, were, that were examined and then ultimately presented to the board. Uh, April of 2020 also coincides with the anniversary that the district has with our relationship with Garrison Architects. You get to hear from Bob Garrison tonight as one of the primary presenters. In March of 2020, right before we closed the district down for two weeks at that point with the impact of COVID, um, Dr. Grip delivered a demographic study that he had done looking at the enrollment uh, and projections for enrollment in Cherry Hill. That took place on March 10th of 2020. Also from October of 2019 to March of 2020, uh, additional school building improvement uh, updates were presented to the board about what needed to be done and where were we. May 28th of 2019, uh, oh, I'm reading the wrong way. I apologize. April of 2020 through January of 2021, talked about March, of, March 23rd of 2021, Cherry Hill Public Schools Long Range Facilities Plan was presented to the board. Uh, the Long Range facility plan, Facilities Plan is a compliance item that every school district has to use and every school district has to go through and has to ultimately be approved by the Board of Education and then submitted to the state of New Jersey. It's within the long range facilities plan that we identify projects and work that need to be done within the district. In March of 2021, uh, we saw the impact and the tremendous work uh, that our partners at Garrison Architect and the folks with whom they work, uh, what they did and what they put together. Last summer in July of 2021, uh, we delivered a bond referendum 101 presentation to the board to talk about if we are going to continue on in this process, this is what takes place. This is what it looks like for us during the course of the next year or year and a half. From October through December this past fall and into the early winter, community town halls on the building improvement plans were held uh, throughout the district. There were ones held individually at each one of the schools and we had community wide ones that were done in a hybrid model where people could attend in person uh, and participate via Zoom. And then December 2021 through January of 2022, which is where we are right now, uh, we had a community-wide thought exchange on the building improvement plans. I'm gonna go through and talk a little bit about uh, the thought exchange and what we found um, that the community submitted in terms of their ideas. So this is the question that we put out there. This is what was asked of the community to participate. 
Now that you've attended the Cherry Hill Public Schools Improvement Plan Town Hall and or viewed it online, what additional thoughts do you have about the top priority needs for our school district? As this was out for a couple of months, we had 464 participants. Those 464 participants, and they made up a cross section of our community, they submitted 304 thoughts. They took the time to type out an individual thought about what they believed was a priority in our district. And for those 304 thoughts, there were 9,056 ratings, 9,056. This is what the breakdown of the participants looked like. 272 of the participants identified themselves as parents in the district. They had 198 of the thoughts, more than 7,200 of the rankings. 60% of the participants identified themselves as parents of a child with an IEP. They submitted 26 thoughts and had 485 ratings. And then 63 parents identified, uh, participants identified themselves as parents of a child with a 504. They submitted 52 thoughts and had 860 ratings. 44 participants identified themselves as staff members in the district. And this could be from certificated folks to non-certificated folks, um, administrators, just somebody that works for the district. And then 25 people identified themselves, uh, other participants as being community members without any children in the district. And they submitted 15 thoughts and 187 ratings. We also asked two questions uh, of the folks. They had, to, they had to answer these two questions uh, after they identified what demographic group they, they fell into. The first one says, we've always taken pride in our area for being a good place to live and raise our family. We must continue this tradition, support improving our school buildings and keep our schools strong. Folks had the opportunity to agree or to disagree with that statement. 97% or 440 of those people agreed with that statement, while 3% or 14 of them disagreed with that statement. So again, an overwhelming show of support for that statement. And then the second question was, you don't have to look, or statement was, you don't have to look far to see what happens to communities that fail to maintain the quality of their schools. We can't afford to let that happen to our district. 96% of the respondents, 425 people, agreed with that statement, while 4% of them, 19 of the people, disagreed with that statement. So again, overwhelming support. This is called a word cloud. Um, so with artificial intelligence, uh, the information that was placed into the thought exchange, all the different statements that were made, uh, they go through and then analysis is done of all of those statements. And then the words are put together that show up most often and the words that show up more than the other words show up larger in the word cloud. So you can see the things that people were concerned about, compliance, technology, learning, space, ADA, accessible, classrooms, uh, safe, health, safety, improvements, environment, uh, all the things that came through that shown through in the statements that were made. Then there are key thoughts. Uh, I'm gonna go through a couple of sheets of these. Uh, so again, these go through based on the ratings uh, that, that people make. So you can see over on the right-hand side of the screen, you see a number and then a set of stars. Uh, so the number is the average rating that was awarded to that statement. And then in the parentheses, you can see how many participants rated that statement. So as a, for instance, um, this first statement was the highest rated statement uh, that we had uh, based on the numbers. Please ensure our children are in a healthy place without mold and AC with filters older than three months. We need to make sure they are safe, healthy, and happy. At four and a half stars, 28 people rated that. That was the number one rated comment out of the 304 comments. Number two, ADA compliance should be a given. Our school should be accessible for all students. And number three, healthy buildings. Students cannot learn without, with water dripping from the ceiling, mold, mice. So again, those are the top three thoughts uh, when we did the analysis from the entire thought exchange. And then top themes by the star score, by the number of stars, ADA compliance, instructional spaces, kids, safety, technology, values, buildings, priority, safe, and central admin. And then just give a minute as we go through, um, the next top thought, the category dealt with the bond, which kind of makes sense, being that this is what the thought exchange focused upon, is a school improvement.
We can move it, Mrs. Wilson. The next area, ADA compliance. And again, as we already talked about, one of the top three statements is in this area. Instructional spaces. The kids, can a word that you would think would come up? Safety, always a top area. Technology. Values. I have to say in, in this values one, uh, the middle statement that's on this page, one that, that every time I go through this really jumps out to me. Not originally from New Jersey, but moved to Cherry Hill because of what I heard about the schools. However, I was shocked to see the condition of some of the buildings. If folks expect to maintain good school standings and the property values that come with it, improvements are needed. We hear so often that people are here because of the schools. Uh, each year when we meet new families and people tell us why they moved here, often it's from the school because of the schools. Uh, and that's something that this is not a, a foreign statement to so many of us that have the opportunity to meet new families. I can tell you, even families of, of people who grew up here in town, moved away, and then have returned to raise their children or raise their families have made similar statements, uh, being surprised at, at where we are with the buildings. The buildings overall. Priority, again, folks use the word priority about focus. Safe, having safe buildings and safe environment for our children. And then just the next steps, be carefully considering what we learned moving forward. And that brings us to where we are tonight. Again, I thank everyone who participated in the thought exchange. We took the time to come out to the meetings who participated in the discussions or used our plan at chclc.org email address to submit longer statements uh, or more information. Um, there was a tremendous share going on in Cherry Hill. Uh, and typically as many as you know, as many of you know, we are not often at a loss for people sharing their perspectives. Um, people came out uh, and really did participate. Special thank you to all the board members for their participation in so many meetings throughout the course of the fall. We are very excited about these next steps. Uh, and Mrs. Sugars, I'm gonna turn it over to, I guess, Mr. Garrison. Bob, if you're all set. Great, thank you, Dr. Malash. Sounds good. Wonderful, thank, thanks again for having me, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations to the two new uh, board members that I just met this evening. Uh, we've been on this journey when you did the timeline, can't believe that it's almost been two years. This April would be two years. I joked uh, on that particular evening when I was hired to Mrs. Sugars that I, that I was getting an apartment here in town. And, uh, and we haven't gone to that extreme. We spent a lot of time. Really enjoyed uh, all of the, the past 18 months working here in the district. Uh, tonight, uh, the format's a little bit different. You're not only going to hear from me, but some of the other district professionals. A lot of the meetings I talked about the help and the role, not only of the Garrison Architects, maybe in a leadership role, but all the supporting cast that we're going to need uh, in order to launch this referendum and be successful. So over my left shoulder is Rob Notley uh, from New Road Construction Management. Uh, Rob was instrumental in managing, helping to manage the, co the contracts this summer. Those were the roof replacements that I talked about at uh, the five schools and, and currently the emergency generator projects that we have. Tony Salamini to my immediate right, uh, bond council. Tony will be critical in strategizing about the language, not only for the question, what it eventually makes it to the ballot, but also strategization of how that looks and, and what it looks like. And then Sherry Tracy, what will we do without our finances and, and, and our numbers person? And so that's Sherry's role in this particular project. So we'll go to the, uh, the table of contents the agenda for this evening. Again, Bob Garrison, pleased to be with you. 
uh, Sherry, Tony, and Rob will also assist me in the presentation this evening. Additionally, uh, I'll talk in specifics, and I've gone over this before. I think it was at that 101 uh, presentation that I made where I talked about prioritization or different levels of projects. So what we've done is we've broken that $400 million, that, that huge, large number that's out there. We broke it into different levels and different categories. We reinvigorated the pie charts, broke them down, gave a little bit more detail, and I'll be describing some of those things, some of those needs that we found and the costs associated with that. We'll then talk a little bit about the district improvement estimated tax impact, that long awaited information uh, that we've been eager to share with the residents and the Board of Education. New Jersey State funding opportunities. Uh, I've talked in that in the past. I have some updates for some new information. And then proposed bond referendum schedule. Uh, the, the schedule has really been honed down to sub September of this year. And then, of course, question and answer. So the journey has been uh, for the last 18 months the site visits, field surveys of the school facilities. Rob Notley, as I mentioned, is here this evening from New Road, but as I've mentioned previously, we've also had input from environmental resolutions. Environmental resolutions, looking at the site aspects, the ADA concepts that are much needed at our facilities, the new driveways of circulation and all those different things. TTI Environmental looked at all of the environmental impacts. What happens when we take the roof off at Carusium we have to deal with the plaster. What happens when we go in the boiler rooms and have the elbows and the VAT that's budgeted for in the program? So TTI was instrumental in that. With that team and with that survey, we evaluated again all the facility needs district wide. We identified these needs to include essential health and life safety building systems and many, many other systems. We proposed facility solutions. What are those facility solutions? In some instances, equalizing the elementary schools with the addition of all purpose rooms or creating a cafetorium uh, at Rosa School or rebuilding a wing of a high school for specialized instruction. Those different solutions we'll talk about again this evening and I'll revisit that with you. Through the help of New Road in our office and our estimators and our cost estimating professionals, we estimate a probable cost. And we'll share that again with you and summarize that. You know me pretty well. We'll do, skip through that particular slide. We'll go right to, to Sherry. Sherry, you want to say a few words about your expertise? Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, as, uh, as Bob mentioned, I'm Sherry Tracy with Phoenix Advisors, I'm essentially the numbers person, so uh, the finances. So I take all of the information that Bob gets for me with the total cost of the project and the estimated amounts of state aid, put everything all together, um, look at the average um, home value in Cherry Hill, total assessed value, and put together some of the tax impact numbers that we'll be talking about a little bit later on tonight. That's some of the pre-referendum work that, um, that I do. And then when it comes time to, once the referendum is successful, is passed, then we will assist the district in working through actually going to the market for the bond sale, helping to obtain um, a bond rating. Since currently, since the district doesn't have any debt outstanding, um, your bond rating's also gone away too. Um, the bond rating's only tied to debt. So since there's no debt, there's no rating at this point. So we would assist with that process. Um, and then all of the steps needed in order to sell the bonds to the marketplace to investors. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, good evening, everyone. Tony Salamini from Willens Goldman and Spitzer. Uh, we have the privilege to serve as the district's bond council. And what our role is to make sure that you meet all the legal requirements in preparation for the bond sale. We assist then with actual drafting the bond question or questions that will appear. We prepare all the necessary resolutions, and then we handle all the legal aspects in connection with the authorization and sale of the school bonds. Good evening. I'm Rob Notley with New Road Construction Management. Uh, thank you for uh, for having myself and my fellow professionals here tonight. 
Uh, New Road is located in Cherry Hill. Uh, we are a professional services firm that provides construction management and about 90% of our work is providing that service to K-12 school districts. We've been engaged with Cherry Hill schools for about the last two years. Um, our role kind of develops through the course of the, uh, of the, of the referendum and the, the subsequent uh, execution of the projects. Um, we've been supporting Garrison and the district through the pre-referendum phase. Um, as we get into pre-construction, we'll do more detailed cost estimating, uh, review of the construction documents that the design professionals put together. Uh, when we get into construction phase services, that's where we really start to, uh, to spread our wings. Uh, we'll have full-time on-site construction management. Uh, the number of people that we'll have on-site will depend on the number of projects that are, that are going on at any one time. With a district this large and a referendum program as extensive as this, that will probably be a, a, a pretty large construction management effort. Um, the main thing that we that we our, our, our primary goal during that that part of the uh, of the project is maintaining safety and security of students, staff, and the public throughout construction. Um, and we will just act as an advocate for the district and always serve in the district's best interest. We'll follow that right right through to post construction. Make sure these projects wrap up in a timely fashion, and um, get the school trained up on uh, on all their new buildings and uh, and equipment. Thank you. So going back and, and thank you everybody. As you can tell, we've got a great group of professionals here that have that have worked uh, seamlessly together. Uh, currently working with uh, many of these individuals on multiple multiple projects. So we're we're well schooled and that relationship will, will prove to be valuable as as we uh, launch on this effort. So I, I began this evening talking about the, the 101 presentation that I gave. And during this journey, the question was always asked, well, how do we break this down? How do we as lay people put some type of priorities or some type of order, if you will, to what you found. And I thought a lot about that and it really couldn't be subjective. It had to be based on fact or knowledge or in this instance, a governing body like the Department of Education. So the Department of Education in 2000 created the levels for which I broke this referendum, proposed referendum down. So I didn't, author this, this is something that state government has deemed through their research to be level one, level two, and level three, where you could say that the top priority in their mind when they were dealing with funding in 2000 to a, a lower value. So let's visit those different levels. The level one projects are the most critical operating building needs, including health and safety and program mandates. First and foremost, and I was so pleased to see the responses from our tours and our meetings to be captured in that first bullet, right? Essential building systems, essential. Essential is water and air and security and dry schools. That's what we heard throughout the, the different comments that were made. So essential building systems, structural, those are our facades in our buildings, mechanical, electrical, cooling, and plumbing systems. The envelope, warm, safe, and dry, right? It's not raining in, in the classroom. Repair, replacement of roofs, windows, and masonry, and top priorities. Building code compliance, something as simple as ex interior doors. Interior doors right now that don't have closers or that, that aren't rated or have the 100 inches of vision panels that are called for in the Department of Education's facility efficiency standards. So that's not only a building code, but also a DOE code. ADA, huge theme in the input that we heard. Site and building access, toilet room renovations, widening of doorways to classrooms, access to playgrounds, improvements on the playgrounds, hazardous materials, asbestos, vinyl asbestos tile that we have, pipe insulation, and plaster, security and communications, public address, telephone, 
building entrance security systems, door access, site drainage to remediate an existing problem, not in conjunction with new construction. So new construction in the state's eyes for new parking overflow areas is another priority. And I'll show you where that is. Elementary school playgrounds, level one priority. Replacement of playgrounds to meet life safety standards, as well as consumer product safety codes. Then finally in this category, specialized instructional needs. Expansion or the creation of educational adequacy. Renovations of spaces like science labs. And we see that at our high schools and our middle schools in the program. Instructional media centers. I talked about this relentlessly. Instructional media centers, taking those older libraries and making them more instructional. That's how we get better instructional space for our students, more flexible space within the means, instead of constantly building new construction, which you as a board have heard me talk about, is penalized in the funding formula. STEM labs, robotics, career spaces, especially at our, at our high school level. Those are all the things that we identified and that we talked about in, in our building tours. So when we go to the pie chart, the thing that jumps out us, at us, which is the number one uh, priority, that was one of the first bullets, was all the essential building systems. And first and foremost was HVAC. HVAC at $80 million, one of the largest pieces of the pie shown to you right there in green. We talked about the HVAC. The HVAC is complete replacement of existing aged systems and the introduction of indoor air quality aspects when we replace that equipment and the introduction of air conditioning. The biggest, the most common piece of equipment in district is a univentilator. And we saw that on our tours, that's the box that's under the windows, some 800 of those, right? We have unit ventilators that provide heat only. We wanna upgrade that. We wanna have them provide heat and air conditioning. Working to the left, replacing the PA clocks, telecommunication, telecommunications and technology. Another significant investment of $10 million. HVAC power, because when you introduce air conditioning in the green piece of the pie chart, you have to power it. And when you power it, you bring new power into the building, enables other things to occur. Those are convenient outlets. 21st century learning tells us that we have more pieces that we need to power and connect to. Security, fire alarm in a limited number of schools, the generators in a limited number of schools. The smaller piece working to the left, million three, hot water heaters, domestic water, and getting our water bottle, water filler replacement. District's done a nice job up until this point doing that. This will take care of the rest of that. Replacing the interior doors, frames, ADA access, modifications, and most importantly, providing intruder hardware, $14 million investment. Unisex staff, bathrooms, classroom bathrooms, all bathrooms, $11 million investment. There, what we're talking about is completely gutting those spaces, making sure that they're ADA compliant with proper circulation, as well as low consumption fixtures for energy conservation. Media centers, media centers, again, a large investment, instructional media centers, converting them, reconfiguring them, reinvigorating them new furniture, new colors, new themes, new input. On one of the building tours early on at West, I walked in the front door and I was handed a drawing from the principal because the staff there and some of the students had created the vision for the media center over at West School. So I knew we were on the right track in including that in the program. Elevators, new elevators, elementary school, high school, again, to facilitate more ADA compliance and then making sure that the elevators that we have, especially at the high school, have the modernization that's required, not only from mechanics, but also to meet uh, the ADA compliance initiatives. There in orange or, or lighter yellow, science labs, uh, music, 
F-wing con construction, stages, all of those renovations are there in, in a big investment on the inside of the building. With the exception of F-wing, which we talked about at length, that's over at East where we're tearing that down and reconstructing that, introducing some new bases. The one thing that's a little bit different here that stands out really as a unique school aspect is Carusi School. At Carusi School, because of the plaster that's under the roof, which has to come off, the plaster that's in the corridors, which is in the way of all of our construction, we have to rent temporary classroom units, relocate those students out so that we can safely abate the plaster and do the interior construction that is most needed. Hazmat, an appropriate uh, topic going to the right with the green piece of the pie chart. Hazmat, as I mentioned, vinyl asbestos tile, the plaster and Carusi, uh, pipe elbows, and anything else that is affected when we do our construction and renovations. Please note that the asbestos that is in the buildings is non-friable in its current condition. It's only when we touch it do we have to abate it and make sure that's done safely. ADA compliance for site drainage, paving, playgrounds, large investment uh, there in the light blue. Interior signage. This is ADA compliance signage. Every single building, every single room. Ambitious project, $2 million investment. Masonry, window, lintels, EFIS, which is the exterior insulation finish system. It's that drive it looking thing that you see uh, when you drive down the road. Also uh, caulking, exterior door repairs, replacement, $17 million investment. Roofing, preserving that community asset, making sure that it's watertight, $31 million. As I mentioned, the district did five roofs, stocked in the entire roofs and then four partial roofs at Rosa and three other elementary schools. So the district has done investments in the building, but there's still some roofs that are out of warranty. Then we have the areas in blue, uh, the curtain walls, the exterior windows, the facade repairs, all those blue things that are outside the building. And that takes us to a level one total construction cost of just over $300 million. Level two. So the state defines level two as renewal of existing buildings, overcrowding, and improvement in the quality of instructional spaces, and in many cases, other interior renovations. And let's go through those uh, specifically. Repair or replacement of existing building systems and components not included in level one. So level one was all those things that I just went through. So in level two, these are common things as interior finishes, floors, walls, ceilings, interior lighting, casework, furniture, kitchen equipment, and front entrance canopies. All of those things, as we know, are in our proposed program. Existing site upgrades, upgrades to sidewalks, paving, fencing, and exterior security lighting not ADA issues. So the ADA issues, again, are in level one. So if we have to build an ADA accessible route to a playground, that's in level one. Or we have a drainage issue for paving, that's in level one. Renovations, reconfiguring, and our new construction of capacity generating classrooms to eat overcrowding. These are such things as small group instructional rooms. We are creating some small group instructional rooms Specifically, if we move the main office to the outside of the building with new construction, we're also creating nurses suites when we do that. All purpose rooms are um, in that in renovations. Technology infrastructure, department's technology plan does not include equipment, obviously, because we'd be bonding these improvements over 20 years and we don't want to buy the equipment with borrowed money that has a life expectancy that's less. So the pie chart for, for level two, start with the largest area. Upgrade to the gymnasiums and the locker rooms. In the, the gymnasiums, we're talking about floors, finishes, uh, air conditioning, lighting, 
locker rooms. Uh, that was a highlight of the tour. We went into the locker rooms. Uh, many of those are original. Uh, got to kick out a lot of the residents say, I think I know my locker's still here, probably has padlock on it, probably still have stuff in there after uh, 40 or 50 years. Uh, APRs, upgrading, finishing those staves, lifts, uh, lift removals, folding partitions, that type of work. Auditorium upgrades. Large money is proposed for upgrading the auditoriums, sound and lighting systems, as well as seating and finishings. Those are deemed a level two from state government. Kitchen equipment and replacement. Uh, so this is select pieces throughout the district. Exterior lighting kind of speaks for itself. There's not a lot of exterior lighting. The district has a great partnership with PSE&G on a lease lighting program uh, where the district uh, pays the cost of the utility and PSE&G supports the replacement and upgrading of the fixtures. Classroom lighting, large investment there uh, for classroom lighting as a level two. Classroom flooring, this gets into the finishes of uh, the partition walls that we had. Remember, those are the old fashioned folding partition walls that don't facilitate sound transmission very well and are, are not really used that much. Cabinets and casework, our cabinets and casework, all those buildings that I talked about on the corridor wall uh, go into portable units. Uh, conversions to SGIs, there's a few schools where we have some space. Uh, it's reconfigured and converting that to SGIs. Nurses suites as well. Main entrance reconfigure uh, and canopies. We have those in a, a number of the schools. Lighting, ceilings, painting on the interiors, uh, largely in our, in our corridors and our other areas. To complement that, hallway lockers, as well as teacher lounges in all of the buildings proposed for upgrades, as well as um, the cafeterias. That brings us full circle on level two. In level three, major projects that include renovation and or new construction that aren't necessarily capacity generating. So as I mentioned, one of the things that we identified when we went on the facility tour is that not all the elementary schools are equal uh, with respect to all purpose rooms. That would be multiple spaces for large group instruction, eating, recreation, uh, performance, et cetera. So in the plan, proposed plan, there are six all-purpose rooms at the elementary school level. The athletic fields and related, related work uh, is also level three from the state of New Jersey, as well as the patio cover areas. We heard on our facility tours that those new sunshades and those particular areas were widely popular, especially with um, the challenges that the staff has in using the particular buildings. So in level three, out of the $35 million piece, the most prevalent part of that pie is the six all-purpose rooms, some $26 million investment. Kitchen addition, small, it really occurs at one of the elementary schools where we have to make the main entrance work a little bit differently than main entrances there at 2.7. Those are a limited number of, of elementary schools as, as well as uh, Rosa School. Athletic facilities, uh, $4.2 million there. New parking area, parking areas, either overflow parking, new driveway, 312,000 patio covered areas are there in orange basketball court reconstruction, and then LED monument signs. LED monument signs were contemplated at every single school, uh, standardization of messaging, as well as identification and access to uh, the front door and definition, defining the main entrance, if you will. So now that we have all of those things identified in the first example, all of the projects, there's this, all the projects in level one, level two, and level three, everything that we identified, that $403 million that's out there. As Sherry mentioned, I've handicapped that if you look at the individual presentations, right, they were in green, I estimated what the state share would be. 
So I took all of the projects district-wide, that's level one, which is highly eligible at 40%, level two, which has some things a little less, and then level three, remember we have that $143 challenge with the new construction at 40% of the state government. So that reduces that down. So on average, we're looking at about 31% get everything. That's $126 million of debt service aid after discount. Uh, after discount was something that we talked about also on the tours. The district is entitled to 40%. The governors have underfunded debt service aid to the districts in the amount of 15%. So when Sherry does her calculation, we always do them at 85% of 40% because we don't want to mislead the board or the taxpayers based on historical data, based on the tradition of the governors when they formulate the Department of Education budget or this aspect of the Department of Education budget because there's a lot of other things that go into that. So we're fully representing that and being transparent that that state aid could be 126 million, not 40% or 160 million if you do the simple math, right? So taxpayer share 276 million. Well, the tax impact per year, per year on 276, because we would get the debt service aid over the life of the loan, let's say it's 20 years, is $511.05. This assumes that that is the tax impact on the average assessed home. Because the tax calculator on the website will tell you what your specific tax is if you own a home at $200,000 or $400,000, but we have to have a baseline. And that baseline is the average assessed value of 225,473. When Sherry does these calculations, she's very conservative. This is a great interest rate, 2.75 over 20 years, right? Historically low when we borrow money. So that's the example if we did all of the projects. Let's say the Board of Education wanted to do the level one projects. Well, the level one projects, we look at the pie chart, $308 million. The state share goes up because we don't have a lot of new construction that drags that down in level one at 34%. The taxpayer shares 203. In this example, the tax impact per year would be $376.17 for all of the projects in level one. That's three quarters of the needs that we identified in the assessment. If we go to levels two and three, those are $94 million. The state share again is 21 million. Remember level three is that low funded area because of the new construction. And you see it there, level two is 3145, level three is only eight and a half percent because we can't build something for $143. So that tax impact for levels two and three is $134.87. Now, one of the things that we thought, talked about and I brought up at a lot of my presentations and it's still true today is I don't have a lot of referendums that are 300 and some dollars a year, right? Uh, Mr. Salamini's got a, a referendum up North Jersey. They'll set a new record for $241 million for a new Hoboken high school that has a nice inning rink and a couple of pools and, and a partridge and a pear tree. And that tax impacts about $500 a year. So maybe that's a, a record setter on Tuesday. We'll have to see what happens on that particular evening. But because we gave a lot of thought to that, Tony, when we were strategizing for the presentation, said, you know, another option that the district has always done a great job about is using their capital reserve, being fiscally responsible, using their capital reserve money. And what do I mean by that? Well, this year I just talked about the capital reserve solving the roofing issues at Stockton, Rosa, and the other three elementary schools. The capital reserve money that is putting emergency generators into four schools the capital reserve money that put LED lighting in a lot of the elementary schools, the capital reserve money that did some of the prototype classrooms at the elementary schools, the capital reserve money that you've used to improve some of the media center finishes in some of the areas. 
So the district has always spent, and I think Mrs. Sugars put this number out between five and $12 million a year in capital reserve, proper budgeting to maintain your facilities. So what happens if the suggestion, and Mr. Salamini had this suggestion, is to use a portion of that capital reserve to offset the tax impact. Here's the key to the whole thing. The reason, one of the reasons why districts bundle projects and do bonding, it's because it's expensive to issue and expensive to create, but more importantly, they get state aid when they borrow money. One of the early things that we talked about, gotta borrow money in order to get state aid, There's no other way around it. And you, you need to get your fair share here in this community. By using the capital reserve money, kind of like an advanced or help to the taxpayers, you still get the debt service aid because we would put the full cost of that particular project in, but yet the capital reserve account helps the payment of the debt service. Therefore, the district can reduce the taxpayer share of the payment of the debt service. This would be proposed annually in the budget and would require board approval this year. However, in any given year, the board could choose not to approve this as part of the budget. So it doesn't bind the future boards. It's, it's an idea uh, that we wanted to present to you this evening. And I think you're gonna like the results. If we go back and we say, okay, the level one projects, the level one projects at 308, the state share again, taxpayer shares that same 203 billion with a contribution of $3 million, not the five or 12 that Mrs. Sugars and traditionally you've been doing at the last year, a portion of that goes towards the bond. Then the tax impact is $291 and 21 cents a year over the life of the bond, as long as that $3 million contribution is made. And I think that's something that uh, certainly resonated with me as a concept that we wanted to share with you as, as a board. Then if you say, okay, let's do all the projects with the contribution of $3 million, the tax impact is reduced to $426.09 for everything that's with a $3 million contribution. Something else to think about. So next steps, determine the scope of the projects. We have everything laid out, tried to break it into different pieces. Decide if there's going to be one question or two questions. Explore this idea of capital reserve contribution and maintain getting state aid, getting that debt service aid on that item and then helping the taxpayers out of the annual budget. And then finalizing the applications so that I can do my due diligence on 18 or 19 buildings because we've got to put those applications back into the state to solidify the numbers that you presented here this evening in green. New Jersey State funding opportunities, just real quick to, to go back over this. Debt service aid, that's what we're talking about as the primary mechanism. Remember, we get debt service aid over the life of the loan. We have to borrow money, simple authorization from the voters in order to get that. We were on a call with the New Jersey BPU uh, just the other day. Uh, you have actually a resident here in the community that works for the BPU. We were happy to talk to uh, Michelle Rossi about that program, explore that program. New Jersey Smart Start is something that I maintain. I shared with Mrs. Sugars that at a referendum in Burlington County, Rancocas Valley, they got $270,000 in rebates after it was all said and done. There are other programs that are out there that we talked to her about. Uh, we have some other applications that'll be going in to try to reduce and bring back that more money to Cherry Hill Township. Capital Reserve is another way to fund this. I added that to the slide. Uh, that's the, the thought process that we're, we, uh, we created that, that we leave you with for discussion. The proposed bond referendum schedule. Uh, schedule really hasn't changed. Our goal is to get these applications in 
um, in the near future to the Department of Education so that we can not have a September 27th, 2022 uh, election. Tony actually reached out to the, the governor's office again about moving that election because of the Jewish holiday. They're well aware of it. So he and I are both working on that, uh, but it's our opinion that that'll either be moved back a week or ahead a week. So we'll see where, where that particular thing lands. But please be assured that we are seeking the answer to that question and there'll be a lot of other people with seeking the same answer uh, as they plan for referendums in September. So with that, um, did I miss anything, Mike? Roger. Okay. So we'll turn it back to you, Mr. Avati. Thank you, Mr. Garrison. Um, before we proceed, I'd just like to give my own thanks and I'm sure the board joins me. Um, Bob, Sherry, Tony, Rob, we know you worked hard and you know, really helped game this out to, to tee up this conversation. Um, and that work is much appreciated. You know, this we know how important it is. It's been a lot of time talking about it, but this is the fruition of I think everything we've asked for in the you know the the analysis that's so helpful to the discussion that will ensue. So, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mrs. Tong, who is since last we met Bob, she's now the strategic planning chair um, to go through some board member questions and to to help to help move this discussion along. All right, so Mrs. Tong. Just a uh, Has anybody, um, does anybody have questions? Um, raise your hand. Oh. Um, the audience or something? Uh, oh, okay. Okay, Kim, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Garrison, the idea of the capital reserve um, potentially being able to contribute <laughs> to the annual cost and revisit it, where did you come up? How, how did you all come up with the $3 million figure? The $3 million was, was a formula of getting that prioritization level less than $300. So you could do, to answer your question, you could add to that in one of the other scenarios and reduce that question's amount accordingly. Maybe you wanted to put more in and not have 400 and some dollars for all of it. So it was just a snapshot to get that level one under 300, because that's something I talked about as being kind of the magic number. Okay, so then, I, I also would assume that because potentially a large portion of the work would be accomplished through this bond, you would have some flexibility with the capital reserve to be able to do this because you'll have the upgrades in the buildings. So the annual repairs to what's in place that is old and outdated will now be newer <laughs> or in the process of being new. So that gives some flexibility with the capital reserve dollars? Absolutely. Okay. And one of the things that we talked about as we came through this project, the use of the capital reserve with no state aid is solving the expiration of roof warranties. That's what we solved, the district solved in the last five years because we did Stockton roofs and we did the 2000 roofs which were out of warranties. So you're using the capital reserve for those critical things that you have to use instead of using it to buy furniture for an instructional media center, for instance. So yes, with the new equipment, to be less pressure on that account to draw down such large dollars. Mr. Wu. So um, I apologize for uh, being a brand new boom board member and coming to this really late in the game. Um, but a, a question that, that arises to me is like, um, there's a lot of projects, a lot of things to fix. Um, it's a big price tag. 
and we're servicing debt over over 20 to 30 years. If we let's just say hypothetically we did everything on our to do list, does that get us through? Does that last us more than 20 years? Like how 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 long are these improvements going to uh, keep the Cherry Hill school system uh, being pristine or being being improved? Great question, and it's nice to meet you, Mr. Root. Thank you, Dr. Root. Thank you. Um, the life of the bond will be 20 years because I think all we all want to agree on the fact that we don't want to borrow money for a building system that won't last 20 years. So specifically to your question, when we do a roof replacement, that roof replacement will be 30 years with a 20 year payback. When we replace a window, that window will be 45 years. When we replace an interior door, it will exceed the 20 years. The only aspects of the program that will not last 20 years would be things like carpeting with wear and tear, some of those interior finishes. But all of the nuts and bolts, all of the HVAC, all the electric grades, all the roofs, all the windows, all the doors, uh, all the site work, hopefully if we, if we do the site work right and we don't get freeze thaw and, and potholes in the parking lots, but all of that infrastructure work has to by law meet or exceed 20 year average or else Tony can't write the question and Sherry can't get the funding for it. So we're challenged from the financial institutions to make sure that this project is whole and that these projects will last the life of the bond. One of the things that you saw from the presentation is that we won't be buying equipment that'll be obsolete in 20 years. That's why we gotta be very careful with the word IT. It's really the infrastructure for the information technology. It's not going out and buying a new laser printer or something like that, that we wanna finance for 20 years. So all the improvements will be 20 years or more. And if, if I may, I have one more uh, question. Um, again, this is over, over 20, 20 to 30 years. What have you all done in the process? And I know I'm late to the game. Uh, to, to consider growth of the school system. Um, I know that over 20 years, I don't, I don't know what the projections are for growth in Cherry Hill, but has that been factored in? Like, are we gonna get 10 years in and need a new school? Dr. Malash talked about the, the enrollment projections that were done by, by Dr. Grip. And we're confident that with these improvements, um, the schools can accommodate uh, any growth. And here's why I say that. In the presentation, I talked about the creation of small group instructions, creation of special ed spaces. Sometimes in a school, when you have an 800 square foot classroom, it's better to have two 400 square foot small group instructions spaces instead of using eight students for an 800 square foot classroom. So a lot of thoughts been given to the rooms that maybe can be better utilized to create that uh, additional capacity. Plus with the construction of the all purpose rooms, that gives those elementary schools a lot more freedom, a lot more spaces to do the things that they need to do in additional square footage. The reconstruction of the, the F wing at, at the high school, that's an additional opportunity to tear down what's there, recreate that space, better utilize some of that space. So there's different aspects in that. There's no large classroom additions, if you will, but we're working in those spaces. And lest I forget the instructional media centers. We want to see students, and I think Dr. Malash would support this, to go into the instructional media centers and actually have a class in there instead of the, the vacancy that exists in our spaces with just stacks and books that aren't utilized. So. One more, sorry. <laughs> Um, I, I know that, that, that our taxpayers may have one idea of, of how things should go, but our students um, and future taxpayers also have concerns. And I know one of them uh, is, is sustainability and impact on the environment. How have the um, renovations that you've put together and the list you put together and the designs worked to uh, uh, improve uh, energy usage and sustainability within the schools? First and foremost, and, and I guess that was a great question early on, 
what is the bigger, what's the biggest power consumption right now in the district? And you know what that probably is? It's a 1960 or a 1970 unit ventilator, right? With a old motor and a fan wheel and a belt and whatever, using a, a lot of power. When we change that HVAC equipment, just like you change it in your house, the increased SEER ratings, the efficiencies that we get there, the introduction of building automation system controls, controls that actually can control one classroom, controls that do diagnostics, controls that tell us when to turn things on and off and to program them. Um, you have a snow day. The head custodian goes to their phone, turns the boilers off before the school day even starts when he gets the call from Dr. Melanch at 4.30 in the morning or whatever it is, just as a, a quick example. The turning off of lights, the introduction of LEDs, all those things reduce energy consumption. We are, to be transparent, adding air conditioning so it's not a complete loss of power consumption because we are going to be air conditioning, but we'll do it in a responsible way. When we do bathroom renovations, right now, a lot of the schools have the old-fashioned um, toilets and, and urinals that use a tremendous amount of water, not the low consumption that we would be putting in when we replace those particular fixtures. So anything that we can do to incorporate the LEED guidelines. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the buildings are going to be LEED certified. We're not going to have grass on the roof and, and rainwater collection and, and that kind of stuff. But a lot of the other equipment, we will obviously take advantage of that. Recycled materials in carpeting that is purchased. Uh, certain tiles that are, that are purchased through recycling. Making sure that as much as possible, we can be green and still keep our eye on the ball and provide a safe, you know, environment that's proper temperature and, and ventilating. Thank you so much for answering my questions. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Ms. James Lynch. Thank you. And I did want to thank all of you for all the hard work. It's been amazing to see what a road this was to get here tonight. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I do have two questions. The first one um, being, there have been a lot of people that I've been speaking with um, you did speak to it a little bit when Dr. Rood had, um, had asked the question, was about upkeep of everything that is going to be built. Um, you know, and, and I, you had said that, you know, hopefully the thought is that it would be lasting 20 years, but we all know kids, schools, <laughs> things get a little beat up. Um, so I'm wondering where is that money coming from? Is that going to be the rest of the capital expenditures? Like you had mentioned that Mrs. Sugars had said between five and 12 million that they had used in the past, and this would be only the three, so we would have that extra. Um, so that was my question about how that would be handled. Sure, thank you for that. So Mrs. Sugar really has two different accounts, capital reserve accounts for roof replacement and capital projects, if you will, replacement of equipment, that type of thing. Then she has a maintenance reserve account the M1 account that she fills out. So there's maintenance dollars that are different that if a boiler breaks or, you know, whatever, we've got a, a bathroom to reconstruct. So the M1 account would be where she budgets on the maintenance. Yeah, we have a, a very healthy maintenance um, upkeep of our buildings uh, and grounds budget that, that each year that would, um, if anything, be eased by some of these improvements because when you're trying to find parts for a 60 year old you know, ventilator, uh, unit ventilator, that's difficult sometimes. Um, but, you know, we've been using capital reserve dollars to make improvements where we can. Um, we won't necessarily need to do that to the extent that we have been, which then gives us the opportunity to use that money for tax relief, but we will still maintain a very healthy um, maintenance budget within the budget itself. One more point in that regard and you touched on a little bit. When we buy new things, they're, they're gonna be more efficient and they're also gonna have warranties. Mm -hmm. So if something breaks, let's say the compressor goes in an HVAC unit, Mrs. Sugar's not reaching in the pocket and say, oh, that thing's out of warranty because it's 50 years old. We'll have warranties on the equipment, especially mechanical. The other thing that we have is in the specifications, Mr. Notley and I, are big believers in making sure that when we put new equipment in, that the contractor is responsible to make sure and to maintain that equipment for two years. 
So in the first two years, let's say we do all of the unit ventilators at a school, Mr. McCarty and his staff are not changing filters, the contractor's doing that because it's better to buy it on bid day because also I want them to have multiple heating and cooling seasons to make sure the stuff that we bought works. So they're on the hook for two years. So that first two years is like a honeymoon as well. Great, thank you. I did have one additional question. Um, you had spoken about this at some of the presentations. Um, it would, would be and I, uh, the timeline of how we would go about doing this because you had spoken that sometimes it's better to buy in you know, bigger bulk for our district for different prices. But I know some people were worried that if one school gets done then their child might be out of the school by the time you know, they see improvements. So I wondered what type of plan you are thinking about to um, see how the bond is rolled out with that. Yeah, and my comment back to that is it's a, probably a three to five year build out uh, because we obviously can't get all to saturate that in the marketplace and do that. It also largely is affected by which project scope the board chooses. If they choose the path of building all purpose rooms, let's just take that one aspect. The most important thing for me is to make sure that when we design something that I leave it to the facilities and to the next group of people to maintain it. And that we don't have this shotgun approach where, okay, we can buy these doors at this school, but they're not gonna match the doors at other schools, which means we have 60,000 pairs of keys. That's a huge problem, right? Just a, a simple thing of keying a, a system. So if we're gonna build all purpose rooms, we want the same floor, the same door, the same stage, the same curtain, and so the bundling of projects may occur to get like and kind equipment because it leaves it in the best condition to maintain it. Now that's not gonna be wholly possible for $80 million worth of mechanical equipment, right? But we'll do our best to try to do the things that we can. If we're buying boilers, maybe we do the boilers because again, warranties, consistency, ability to maintain should be with certain companies. Roof warranties are a big thing. Right now, the district has a lot of Garland roofs. It's great because Mr. Bart and Mr. McCarty, when they have a roof leak, they don't have to sift through volumes of books and whatever. They know that, hey, look, it's, it's a Garland roof. Let's get Garland out here and, and fix the leak and do that. So we try to be consistent with that in the specifications. Thank you so much. And I agree with you when you were saying about the standardization of messaging too. I think that sort of, you know, is included in what you're talking about, because I, I think our district really needs that um, right now. So thank you very much. Next, please, sir. Thank you. So <clears throat> this will come as no surprise. I have a pretty long list of questions. So I'll try to just go through them really quickly with you if I could. No Some of them are hopefully very easy to answer. Um, are there any ADA compliance um, projects that are not addressed um, in level one? Um, and are there any that are not addressed in level two and three in terms of the list that we have of all of the outstanding ADA compliance issues that have gone on no, for quite some time? Okay. They're, all, they're all in there. So it's access, right, to, to all of our, our exits and entrances, access to our playgrounds, access to our sports stadium, which would be in level three at, at West. So that's the only thing that's in level three. The rest of it is up front in two or one. And the two and one also include the interior ADA. Yes. Okay, uh -huh. thank you. Um, uh, is there air conditioning for all buildings and all existing rooms? Because I know some of our proposal has adding on rooms in is in is the air conditioning that is listed in level one does that include all rooms gyms existing aprs or is that later so down? if if the aprs are get renovated in level two that's where the air conditioning would be in level two but all the general instructional spaces those 800 unit ventilators 800 classrooms are all in level one thank you okay um are elevators being added to any schools Yes, so I have them at elementary school and I have uh, additional elevators at West. Okay, I'm sorry, do you, I'm gonna get really specific. Do you happen to know which elementaries? The elementary is? Knight and Sharp. Knight and Sharp, yeah. Thank you, Knight, Sharp and West. Um, 
And I'll ask one more, uh, I'll stop and maybe hopefully give a chance to come back. Um, instructional music spaces, um, the, um, this, some of this is coming from feedback we've gotten, so sure. I wanna make sure to yeah. ask the questions. Okay. Um, the music, will every, um, will there be any school that doesn't end up with a music room? And also, um, what level are the middle school, I know there's middle school music room projects. Do you know what level those projects are listed in? Two. And, and for the elementary, are they as well? And I know there's some in one, but. Yes. Okay. So some in one and, and some in two. Okay. I'll stop here and hopefully get a chance to come back. Thanks. Okay. Mr. Ovalia. Thank you. Um, so just, uh, just a comment to start, which is, I do like the methodology uh, that you've done to get us to 291 average. I, I, th I think the participation from us at, out of an operating budget, you're quite right. I mean, we can't commit future boards. However, number one, uh, history and, and Mrs. Sugar's information has proved out that this is a reasonable, it still leaves us other dollars. Um, but frankly, I think, I, I think this community wants to see participation from our annual budget. And I think the, the best way to do that is cap reserves. So I've got three questions. Um, I also just want to say, I do like going with the DOE leveling. Um, so that, that scenario to me is very salient. And that, that frankly is, is something I, I would like to individual as, as a single board member move forward with. I've got three questions, um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a break. Uh, my first question, Sherry, we've talked about selling this bond in multiple tranches. The people who I've, I've heard from, which, you know, have said to us, look, it's such a low cost of borrowing. Why would you do that? Wanted to get your perspective on that. Uh, Tony, um, to me, I think we have to go to with one or two questions. I think that's really the universe that's possible here. Can you give us a sense of if it was, let's say one uh, and then two and three as a second question, how would you go about thinking that through? And the, 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 I guess, Bob, part of the campaign value, but also like the plus and minuses. And I wanna to go to Bob to just give us a little more perspective on how we use cap reserve and still maintain the maximum reimbursement for the state. Um, so to answer your first question, um, as far as selling the bonds in, in multiple tranches, um, really, and again, yeah, interest rates are phenomenal right now. They're still continuing to be very low. Um, our office had a sale today for a 30-year bond issue that um, ended up with eight bids and the winner was like a 246. So, um, you know, I have been conservative on the projections, 20 years at 275, but we are expecting rates to rise a bit this year. You know, we've, already, we've seen it a little bit start to happen, not very much. They're still very strong demand for municipal bonds and not enough supply. So um, even as even if the Fed does increase the short term rates as as expected this year, that doesn't automatically mean that the long term bonds are, are going to go up as much or or um, at all, really. Um, they likely will because they've been held um, low for so long. So really, the the decision on how on how to sell the bonds would probably come depending on what the market environment is like after, if the referendum is held in September, after the referendum, as we start to look towards, you know, right at the end of the year, um, potentially in November, December sale for maybe the first tranche or all of it, you know, it may make sense to move ahead with all of it. If we start to see short-term rates go up, maybe we have those two or three Fed hikes by then. And actually, you know, we, we can earn some money on the short term. We can, we can earn some interest now where we haven't been able to in the last two years because interest rates um, in the, our overnight bank accounts or any investment accounts, treasuries have been almost nothing. So if, we're, if we actually see a flattened sort of yield curve where short-term rates move higher and long-term rates are still staying pretty low, we may wanna sell it all at once because we're able to get pretty much the same investment rate on our money that's gonna be sitting in the bank as we're borrowing. Now, I'm not saying that's what will happen, you know, that that's one scenario. So. It's really kind of more of just looking at the market at the time after the sale. Um, but as, as Bob Garrison mentioned, the, the, the time horizon for, for build out of everything is about three to five years. So with that being said, if we don't see um, strong investment rates, maybe it may not make sense to borrow at 
call it two and a half, if we can only earn 50 basis points or 1% on our money that we might not use for five years. So maybe it makes sense to do half of it or three quarters of it. So those are some of the analyses that I'd be very happy to help the board with, you know, down, down the road um, as we look at what the interest rate environment's like at the time. Uh, thanks, Sherry. Um, and I just to piggyback on Sherry, I think that the important point is what the board uh, puts forth to the public is a total dollar amount and a total project and total borrowing authorization. And then once you have the successful referendum, that's where we can have Sherry run many different scenarios to see what makes the most financial sense. But the way to present it to the public at this stage is just with one bond issue, just so they understand the overall tax impact. It's kind of the easiest to explain. Um, so your first question was about having multiple questions proposed at the referendum. Um, I've done this for 20 years and generally speaking, the majority of referendum are done in either one or two questions. Uh, generally speaking, when it's a multiple questions, the second question is contingent upon the first question also passing. Um, with that being said, I have done referendum up to six questions. I think that becomes crazy and convoluted and way too complicated. Um, even three questions, I think, becomes a little crazy and convoluted. Um, so I think uh, one or two questions is probably the best avenue. Um, and I think the way Mr. Garrison uh, laid it out, and depending on what your district needs are, following those levels that the DOE outlined is probably a good way just to think holistically about the projects and to kind of think about the priorities for the public because that's the way the state views the priority rankings. Um, and the last thing I'm gonna steal Bob's thunder about the capital reserve, because once you get an attorney talking, I'm so excited that I don't wanna sit back down. So I apologize, Bob. Um, but uh, with the capital reserve, the benefit is you still get the state aid because each year, Mrs. Sugars is gonna put in the debt service payment to the state. And then you'll, offset your local share by whatever capital reserve contribution you want to make, but the state will pay you the debt service aid on that total number. So you're going to offset the principal and the state will still give you the full debt service aid on whatever you're owed that year for the principal and interest. So that's why when we were talking the other day, it makes a lot of sense because you have this healthy capital reserve, your administration and your board has done a good job with securing those funds on an annual basis to have those. And now by using them with the debt service aid, you know, you're kind of getting like almost, you know, a double bang for your buck. Because if you're just spending them as you are now on your annual projects with your roofing, et cetera, there's no aid. The only way you can get aid under the current state statute and state uh, form funding formulas is if you issue debt. So that gives you an opportunity to issue the debt, but still use the capital reserve and you're getting more bang for your buck. Because a district like Cherry Hill, you don't really get many other aid other than this is your one big shot of getting aid, so you might as well take advantage of it. And Mrs. Tong, this is Barbara Wilson, just checking in. Um, we are at eight o'clock, which means we are an hour and a half into this meeting. We have about an hour left, just to be mindful that we will have community um, input as well. Thank you for that. Oh, okay, sure. Ms. Fidel? Uh, Mr. Garrison, I just have one one question. I'm looking sure. at the pie chart for level one, mm -hmm. and in the blue, in the in the medium blue, <laughs> you have twenty nine million, twenty nine million two hundred fifty thousand curtain wall masonry repairs, and then it says auditorium wall and facade repairs. Can you talk a little bit about what this auditorium walls sure. and facade are? At the auditoriums, it actually at both schools. We have some, some masonry needs. At West, it would be on the top where we had an incident where the parapet wall had deflected and some emergency repairs were done there. And then of course, East, just like the courtyard wall was repaired this past year with Dandier Construction for $4 million. There's some much needed work at, at East Auditorium. So because those are building skin items and not sound and lighting, that's why they go into level one. Yeah, that's me. 
I just have, because I'm not sure where it fits in into level one. Um, and I don't know if it was included because I, I don't remember this part, but the West intersection, is that where you also included, um, because I remember the conversation where we were talking about the smaller classrooms, if you reconfigure that area, yes. where is that in this? So that's um, going to be a level two. Or in level two, yeah. okay. Yep. And that was a great input, right? High traffic area, students having conflict, didn't see that on the outside because I walk through the buildings when they're not occupied. That's the reason we do tours. That's the reason you do public input. We also have that at both high schools and, and a middle school. Okay. And, and so in doing that, then you'll be able to create those smaller classrooms around right. that space. Okay. We created, um, for lack of better word, a lobby, okay. Ex expand the intersection. Thank you. Oh, okay, Mr. Wu, go ahead. I just uh, uh, thought of one more question in thinking about the financing, just because I want to understand for myself what this really means. Um, so, so when I take out a mortgage, I look at my 30 year mortgage and I realize that I'm paying for two houses. Uh, what's the, what's the interest? Like what, what are we paying in interest on all of these loans? Like how does, how does that work? Estimated um, at 2.75%. Um, and then that's just, uh, I don't think I brought, I don't know if I brought the interest numbers with me, um, but it would be 2.75% of the total. Now, when you repay a bond, there are certain legal requirements that Mr. Salamini will make sure we follow um, it, that needs to conform with state law. So it's a little bit different than a mortgage where we can't just have level payments every year. So you actually do start paying principal back faster than with a mortgage. So with a mortgage, you have the same payment, obviously every, every month or, oh, thanks, Todd. <laughs> always, always prepared. Um, so on the, just to give you an indication, so um, on the 308, which was just the level one projects, um, at 2.75% over the 20 years, interest is about 93 million. So you know, roughly a third of, of the principal. Um, and then we get debt service aid on that too. So Mr. Garrison highlighted the debt service aid based on the principal, the total amount and the reduction, but debt service aid is on total debt service. So it's the percentage of the principal plus the interest. So just to give in this example for um, a total, so if the, the total principal amount we borrow is 308 million, interest is about 93 million. For a total of 402, debt service aid um, would pay for about 136 million. And then the local share, um, and however that was also divided with capital reserve or not, would be about 265 million. Oh, thanks for helping me uh, think about that a little bit more clearly. Um, now, is all of that wrapped into your estimates of increased property taxes, I assume? So I have not done, um, one of the things I did to, to be conservative, again, all my, I mentioned that all my numbers are always, always conservative. Um, I left assessed valuation in the township as flat for the 20 years. Okay. So Cherry Hill has been having increasing rateables, values have, have continued to increase. So as that increases, the average, there's more people or more value paying the same dollar amount. So it's actually gonna, would actually push the, the amount per house down a little bit as, um, as values increased. Thank you. Um, but everything's, I, I held it flat for the 20 years. Anybody else from Marion? Okay, go ahead, Mr. Anybody from this class? No? Okay, hey, go ahead, man. A um, couple quick, hopefully again, hopefully easy to answer. I'm Bob, I'm trying to, um, a lot of people, quite a few people at one of the town halls um, asked about um, lights, stadium lights on the East facilities. Um, and so I just want to check, is that what's in level three under the athletic facilities? The Yes. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, so, 
I also want to just confirm this because we had this discussion, but the average assessed home has not the 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 township has not reassessed even in recent light of recent. So I think right now, you know, we can kind of know these are the most current numbers. So just thinking about the the tax impact. Um, with the, you know, you did this walkthrough originally, I guess almost two years ago. Um, it sounds like you've incorporated some updates as things have come up. And I just want to make sure, like, kind of as things have changed, a lot's happened in two years. Um, you know, are have you kind of incorporated some, you know, new discussions, new design ideas? That, you know, we talked about kind of nurses wellness centers, stuff like that, with you know, in, in this estimate and what you presented tonight. Is that kind of incorporated those updates and also? Part two of that is, it's my understanding, once we submit our propose, this proposal, we cannot change. Is that right? We, the things that are, that are proposed in here, that's kind of the plan and it doesn't necessarily get modified. Is that, I mean, I guess, unless there's an exceptions. Thank you. So some of the things that we incorporated uh, when we went on the tours, we incorporated the need for the lights. So that was one of the, th the different things that we had. We also, doubled back and we made sure that we had ADA access because we had that group on a call tremendously informative, making sure that we had clear paths to our playgrounds, to the West athletic field, you know, doubling down on, on the ADA needs, comforting that group into making sure that they understood that widening of classroom doors, widening of bathroom doors, accessibility within the building and the restrooms and whatnot in the locker rooms was was also included. The transition spaces where we had the high traffic areas that were talked about in those three schools, uh, we added that in. When I talked about the student wellness center, I referred to my work currently at Cumberland Regional and, and Kingsway and using portion of the media center for, for some of that. So that would tie into the reconfiguring of the instructional media centers at all schools. And, and whatever we do, in the way of furniture, technology, comfort of students, and the overall environment, colors and feel, if you will, of, of those particular spaces. So I think that every time I, I reacted to a, a question, I went back and you know the number was in the higher 300s and we pushed it up to almost 405 million. That, that's what we were doing. We were adding different things back in. Great, thank you. And, and then the changes. So what, what happens is, let's say the board decides that they're gonna go forward with the all-purpose rooms. Yes, the principals have had some impact. Well, a better example is the med instructional media centers. So the instructional media centers, I have the design for West because somebody handed that to me, but you know, in the due diligence that has to come, the, the evolution of those plans. We will do our best to get it right for the Department of Education in the layouts in that particular space. That doesn't mean that, and I'm not talking about expanding the footprint or building outside. We can adjust those final plans at the time of final educational adequacy after the referendum passes. Because the Department of Education understands the Garrison Architects and its consulting engineers and the other consultants can't design $405 million worth of improvements 100%. And there's gonna be some things that'll have to evolve. Yes, we, we can get it right, but it's not gonna be perfect. And so that perfect time comes as we develop the plans after it passes. So there is some room there. Just can't go and say, okay, I wanna build an, an F wing over at, uh, you know, at East or uh, at West, like, like East. That's not permissible. Welcome to the Ovalia. Thank you, Mrs. Tong. Let me let me propose a little bit of a methodology. So Mrs. Wilson gave us a time check. Let me try to do a process check. Um, it's okay with you. I would want to hear from Dr. Melange, Mrs. Sugars. We have one more meeting before we vote on this. Where, where do they need us to sort of be in terms of the sense of the board tonight? And then maybe go around the room. I don't want to short circuit public comment, and we really have about 50 more minutes we've promised. That sounds okay with you. That, to me, that seems like the right way to proceed. Part the public. Did it have the two comments? 
Go ahead, Dr. Malash. Thank you, Mr. Vadi. Thank you, Ms. Tong. Um, and again, thank you to our professionals who are here this evening, uh, to Ms. Tracy, to Mr. Salamini, to Mr. Garrison, and to Mr. Notley uh, for what they put together. Um, and especially thank you throughout this process to Mrs. Sugars, um, who continues to be the backbone, backbone of the work and is the liaison between everything that goes on with all the different professionals and with our professional team within the district, Mr. Bart, um, Mr. McCarty and his team, uh, working with the principals, you know, and everything that, that goes through. You know, so as we've had this discussion formally within the district and, and why we put the timeline going back to 2018, you know, as Mr. Sugars and I were talking earlier today, um, it's been a number of years. Uh, I can tell you that, that formally, you know, we've been having this discussion for more than four years leading into the first referendum in 2018 and then up to this one. Um, the work that's been identified in each of those three levels is all work that we believe needs to be done within our school district. Um, you know, I think the determination that we are looking for uh, as we prepare our agenda for next week, you know, and ask the board to approve the projects is, is the board, you know, with, with this information, are they able to say, yes, we wanna do all these projects now. And if not, then we feel that we can do a certain dollar amount worth of projects or a certain level worth of the projects. Um, and then what would the district's plan be to complete the rest of the projects? Um, because again, the projects that are identified in this presentation and, and in all this work, we firmly believe they all need to be done. Um, from the lights on the field to, you know, to, the, to all of the original stuff in, uh, in the buildings, the roofs and, and everything else. Um, you know, so we recommended the projects all be completed, you know, whether that will be included in the referendum and you know that there are financial benefits to doing it that way or you know, whether the board doesn't feel they can go that far. Um, I think is, is really what we are looking forward to. Um, you know, the discussion about the use of the capital reserve money to, to help to offset that cost. Um, you know, we talk frequently in, in our school district about the responsibility that we feel that we have um, to be good stewards of the money that we are, are given by the community to operate this district. Uh, Mrs. Sugars and her team, uh, and you can go back through all of the clean audits that we've had for uh, consecutive years going in, Every single dollar that comes in and it goes out is accounted for. Uh, and they look at this money um, in a very, very intense manner to make sure that it's being spent in a way that benefits our students and it's done in a fiscally responsible manner. Um, the fact that we've been able to continue to maintain the capital reserve that we have and now to take advantage of it to benefit our students and our staff and honestly the community at large, I think it's a tremendous benefit moving forward. Uh, and I think that's something that the board needs to seriously consider. You know, when we got out, you know, we went out and, and Mr. Garrison and his team came in because of the background that they've had with referenda uh, and with what they've been able to do has been incredibly important. You know, he, Mr. Garrison, you know, referenced the, you know, the, the referendum that's gonna go up next week, um, next week, right, Tony, uh, in Hoboken. Um, you know, and, and when we look at the size of our district and the dollars that need to be spent in a fiscally responsible manner, Again, we believe that all the projects need to be done. It's just how does the board want us to move forward in achieving that, 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 that ultimate goal? Uh, we'll now go into the public comment. Um, oh. Yeah. Oh. oh, all right. Uh, we're going to do the census of the board. So, what do you want me to do? Go ahead. Sorry for the. We don't do too many special meetings. Certainly not this board that's about two weeks old. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, you know, uh, my, my my perspective really is, and I, I don't think this will be a surprise to anyone. Um, I would like to go with level one. I would like to go with a three million a year set aside. I would like to do all these projects. But I think clarity of message, maximum of return, and the fact that the DOE is telling us this is level one gives it a certain prioritization. I also think that we're going to have to take into real consideration things that we heard in our roadshow. The lights at East did come up. As a matter of fact, we had a, a very articulate young man at East talk about how that could be a game changer for, for the community whatever of that is not included in level one, I think we need to look at, but I think we need to start to pick. APRs are great. 
but it's going to mean more to some schools than others. Same thing with playgrounds. Um, same thing with a lot of things. I think our ability to choose the prioritization of it is critical. The other piece is, I think, you know, in six or seven or eight years, we're going to have to start a discussion on another bond. We don't want to be in a situation where we're going 20 plus years with no bond progress and no success in getting uh, the public on board with some investment. Um, that happened in this tranche, you know, a lot of well-meaning people did the right things, you know, but when you add it up, a lot of time um, that we were not able to get together on a bond as a community, more than 20 years, we want to plan better in the future. Um, and so, so it's one of those things that I think level one maximizes our degrees of freedom. I agree, I'd like to do all these projects, but we find ourselves so far down the path. So for me, the scenario that, that was sort of presented, uh, you know, the, the one I'm referring to, level one with the 3 million out of ops that flows through capital reserves a year, can't guarantee future boards will go along with it. But to me, that's, that's the comfort area that I have as of this evening. Okay, Ms. Losey. Before, like we can, I would feel more comfortable if we heard from the community right now before I, we get back to this, this part of the conversation. Um, I'm, I just wanna hear community feedback and then we can go back to that. Um, Dr. Malash's comments, I feel, um, I, I agree with what he stated. In fact, I'd like to also see additional capital reserve dollars attached to this, but I wanna hear from the community before I make a decision. So if we can, I'm not sure if, is this part of this conversation? Can we change up the lineup right now? Can we go to community comment? I believe we could. It would be a, a change to our agenda for this evening, but people who know better than me, we don't have Paul, but we'll defer to, uh, we can do that. All right, would, would, would the board sort of agree to move in that direction to hear the public comment and then resurface, or I'm sorry, recircle back for a sense of the board? Okay, nodding heads seem to indicate that's okay. Um, Mrs. Dong, did you want to do public comment? Yeah, let them, let's have some public comments. I guess we're going to do the audience first, and we will have everyone three minutes. Am I right? Three minutes. Please stand, uh, state your name when you come up here and your municipality. Then we'll go, we'll go forward now. Go ahead. Anybody in the, in the um, audience here? Andy McElveen, Cherry Hill. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the board, the staff, and the professionals here tonight for all their work over the last couple of years to get us to this evening. Why did I move to Cherry Hill in 1979? Like many parents, I did so primarily because of the reputation of the schools. Like many parents, I was surprised when I first entered our school buildings and saw the signs of age and disrepair. For 19 years, from 1984 to 2003, each of my children in turn attended our schools. Despite the obvious condition of the buildings at each level of elementary to high school, I'm proud to report that all three received an excellent education in Cherry Hill, graduated from college and has, have grown to be productive citizens and more importantly, to be good people. It's a tribute to our faculty and staff that we can today still provide such a high quality education despite the conditions of our buildings. One of my objectives in seating, seeking a board seat in 1996 and being reelected in 1999 was to do as much as possible to repair our schools so that the quality of our facilities matched the quality of the education that takes place within. During my tenure as a board member in 1998-99, the community supported a $52 million bond issue to address half of the projects needed. The pundits said at the time that it could not pass in Cherry Hill, but the community recognized the need and responded. As it was in 1999, our buildings in 2022 are well past their life cycle. To extend the life cycle of our buildings for another 20, 25, or 30 years, to provide for the health and safety of our students and staff, to continue to provide the quality education our community expects and demands, a bond will need to be approved in the public vote in the fall. Unfortunately, today, the cost of making our buildings as new 
is much larger than in 1999, but that cost will only continue to grow with inaction. The decision on what will be done and how much it will cost falls squarely on this board. Only you can direct the administration to proceed. To begin the process of preparing and submitting the reams of paperwork to gain approval of the county and the state, you will need to vote to do so. In making your decision, I ask that you remember why you are all here, to provide the highest quality education to each successive generation of Cherry Hill children in a safe and secure environment. In my mind, there is nothing more important that we as parents and as a community that we can do to ensure their future. And I reminded of an old uh, aphorism, our community benefits when wise people plant the seeds for a tree under which they will not sit. I ask you to plant that seed and grow that tree. Thank you. Next, um, oh, can you wait? I'm sorry. I have, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Sorry, Ann. Okay, um, there's a student on the, um, eight, Mr. Aiden Wu. Hi, thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Aiden Rood from Cherry Hill. I wanted to speak tonight about the importance of considering the impacts on our school communities of construction uh, as it occurs both in implementing this bond over the next several years, if it passes, and in planning for it right now. Um, our schools are reflective of our community. They're no longer merely the physical buildings that were once built as sort of empty shells to house students and staff. Uh, they've instead grown and developed into unique places that are shaped by the communities they've served. And as necessary as these repairs and improvements we're planning for are, it's equally necessary to ensure that we do not displace and uh, harmfully interfere with the unique parts, with these unique parts of our community in the short term, uh, or of course in the long term. The reason I bring this up is uh, because I'm an editor of Eastside, the newspaper of Cherry Hill School East. Our journalism program at East has a storied history of excellence and community building. And for decades, it has been based out of a unique, large classroom space that sits in the F wing. Eastside, a newspaper that's won countless national awards and provided endless opportunities to young students, uh, could really cease to function if it loses the unique space that it needs to house our 46 person newsroom. With plans in this bond to completely rebuild the F wing spaces, concerns recently emerged uh, in the East Side community that A, East Side may not have an adequate space to use temporarily while this construction occurs, and B, that when new rooms are built, the type of space our program needs may not be included in those plans. So I want to highlight this unique concern and also to highlight this type of issue in a broader sense, as this could apply not only to Eastside, but also to other unique programs within the community. For one, if these type of issues were to occur after the bond is passed with the implementation, uh, the effects could be detrimental to the community. And secondly, and more urgently, if these types of concerns are not addressed now, um, it could be harmful to the bond's chance of passing. Uh, personally, I fully believe in the importance of the bond passing, but on the other hand, if voting day came around and I were to believe at that time that the bond passing would have these negative impacts on a program like Eastside, I may not be able to support it. And I know the same might be true for other community members. So as the district continues to focus on community input uh, this time around for the bond, I just want to urge the board to not only focus on kind of the large scale things like what projects should be pursued, but also on these kind of more focused concerns about implementation and how it will impact students right now that are in the buildings that are going to be undergoing such big changes. Thank you for all the work you've done on this and uh, have a good evening. Okay, now, um, Ms. Anhalt. Oh. Okay, thank you. I want to let the student go first. I think um, is can you let me know who, if you Olivia Olivia go ahead. Olivia. Hello. Okay. Um. So hi, I'm Olivia Hung, and I will be and I'm a junior at Cherry Hill East. I will be speaking about getting lights 
for their East Turf field. If I'm being honest, my in my opinion, as a student and an athlete, East is lacking in school spirit. I feel that the high school experience is a big, uh, high school sports is a big part of the high school experience. I believe not having turf lights is one of the reasons why East lacks school spirit. There is no Friday night light football games or any sports games at night. People are not invested on how our school sports performs. For example, I played in the 2021 Powder Puff game as the running back. And from the feedback I received, both the juniors and seniors played very well and it was fun for both grades. Although many others and I enjoyed playing in the game and being on the team, there was not much of a student section. The senior section looked like they had a decent turnout, but for the juniors, it was only a small handful of boys who came out to support us. A lot of people missed out on watching a very close and great, great game, but I do not fault them because the game was at 11 a.m. on a Sunday, and I doubt most high school kids were even awake. If we had turf lights, the game could have been at night and students could have planned their day around the event so that they would be free to watch the game at night. As an athlete, I also believe playing a game under the lights can be different and quote unquote, alter the way you play, meaning the energy and atmosphere is different than during the day. For example, the East versus West soccer games are always a big hit and kids from both schools come out to support. Because these games are under the lights and at night, the energy is electrifying. Kids get so excited and crazy when their high school scores that they rush onto the field because many of them have never had a Friday night lights experience since neither of East soccer teams play due to the lack of availability of the East field. What what would make my senior field hockey season next year is to have the opportunity to play under the lights at my home turf and maybe a senior day under the lights too. Having lights for the next fall season would be great, but it is more needed for future generations and the morale of the school. I would love to be able to come back to East as an alumni and watch my little brother play the cross under the lights at his home field in high school. Thank you for your time and consideration. Jacob, oh, Jacob is not. Jacob is not okay. I'm sorry, Jacob. <laughs> You're not. Um, and I'm on Cherry Hill. So I'm not going to echo most of what Andy said, um, but I, I agree with him in total. Um, so my question to the board is what are you here for and what are you trying to decide on or reach a consensus for this evening? because it's your duty and responsibility, not only to the students, but to the community to provide the best high quality education in a safe and healthy environment. Going back to the first comments by the student, it's my understanding, Mr. Garrison, that any programs will be accommodated regardless of the construction within the confines of a school. You might wanna clear that up, Mr. Avedia. Um, and it doesn't mean that a program such as a newspaper would be moving to a trailer. Uh, well, God, I used the word I never wanted to use. And probably to a better functioning classroom that students currently have. Um, and yes, you know what? The athletes deserve the lights because they're an integral part of the school community too. It's not just about a STEM program, a science program, or what have you. There are many students who flourish in different environments, not just academics, but music, uh, newspapers, um, athlete, athletes. Um, so this is my take. I am unfortunately a senior citizen. I plan to be here for a few more years. This, will, this bond of 396 million will not impact my family in any way, shape or form. So I am willing to go for 396 million because if what I heard tonight was correct, that if you're using the figure of 511, and you may have to correct me, um, dollars to a home valued at 225,000 plus. That's $42 a month. And I think that my husband and I are willing to find that amount of money um, in order to make these schools better. You know what? We have an excellent, fine, quality school district for the size in the state of New Jersey. 
I don't know why we can't all get behind this. I understand for some that there may be fiscal issues, but on the whole, this is our community and it's about time we all pull together regardless of where we sit and make our schools better because they are the heart of our community. Not the mall, I've said this before, not Haddonfield Road, okay? And certainly not the next blah, blah. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ann. And Mrs. Tong, it's Barbara Wilson, just checking in. We have 30 minutes left for public comment. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Next, uh, Ms. Julie L. Hello, my name. Hello, my name is Julie Lerman. I have a senior still in the schools. I live in Cherry Hill, um, a little less pre-planned and focused than some of the people who've come before. Really appreciative of the work that's come up until now. But I noticed that in some of these tier one level one projects, there's still a number of the real hot button issues, you know, HVAC and improving our heating and cooling is both um, crucial to the well being of our students, but something that also gets a lot of public buzz and, pub and public potential ire on social media. Similarly, um, the balance of security and ADA access to the buildings versus the perception of new configurations benefiting the administrators more than the staff. So I hope that as you continue to move forward with these. I'm afraid hard decisions to make that you're gonna to have to make about what's worthy and what's not worthy, that you also continue to work really hard on your messaging about how what you're going to do is going to benefit the students. Thank you. Anybody in the audience? Rick Short, is it on? Okay, thank you. Uh, Rick Short, 1002 Chelton Parkway. Um, tonight's level one amount, in my opinion, is completely insane. I mean, I can just remember uh, a couple months ago where the board itself couldn't even agree on a zero tax increase. I agree, we need a bond but $308 million is completely insane, the amount. And that's what's gonna be said in the public, in my opinion. My next question is, there was an increase, and I guess this is for Mr. Garrison. There was an increase in the HVAC of $769,000 from the original amount presented before in tonight's number. So did that, does the total number have bipolar? Everyone's gonna ask this question, so just answer it. Is it gonna have bipolar cleaners in it or is it not gonna have bipolar air cleaners? I believe from past meetings, there's 742 air handlers. Don't quote me exactly. So at uh, $1,500 or whatever it is, or uh, $1,000 each, it's my opinion that bipolars are dangerous and a waste of money. Let's move on to the vestibules. That was also a, a hot topic before. Um, some, so, some would probably agree to, to do the 2.7 million, but this other 4.5 million is just more money that is probably gonna, you know, Mr. Garrison said before, don't give us things to vote no for. So, these are things I don't go vote no for. And while I agree with the public, I totally agree East should have lights. I totally agree. But if you put it in the bond, it's just one more thing to vote no for. You can put that in your general uh, budget for next year, and it might even be quicker. You might even be, be able to get lights up quicker, not putting it in the bond. And this 8 million on all this media center stuff, I'd love to see it. But there's other sources, there's sponsorship. And this district says, does nothing to get sponsorship. You don't have a sponsorship package. These are the things you guys gotta have if you wanna get a passable bond. 
you got to be able to hit every deflection that anyone can possibly have. But the bond is too much, and you've got all these little, little um, sprockets that, that aren't going to mend together. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, Beth. Miss Beth, you go. You're next. Okay. Sorry, it, it took a few seconds for the unmute button to come up. Um, hi, Beth Becker, Cherry Hill. Uh, first of all, I just want to echo everything that Andy McElveen said. And I think um, speaking to former board members who went through the last bond process uh, 23, 22 years ago um, is a really good idea. I think he has a very good point that they only went for half of what was necessary and everything else got kicked down uh, the road and here we are. Um, I personally don't think uh, anything on that list is, is really um, not necessary. I think everything is, is necessary. Um, you know, everything is necessary for some reason, right? So even the APRs in the elementary schools, they may not seem like a big deal, but if we had, um, two large spaces in every elementary school, uh, like an APR um, and a gym or cafetorium, whatever they're called, um, we would have been able to spread kids out more for lunch during COVID. So all of these things um, have a huge impact on uh, student life. Um, Dr. Malash said, uh, you know, how are we going to do everything needs to be done, right? So how are we going to do it? So it's, it's a matter of, uh, are you going to put the first 300 million in a bond and then we're going to try to figure out how to do the other um, 90 something million dollars worth of projects. And he's right. It all has to be done. So how are we going to allocate our money to do it? And this is the most fiscally responsible way to do it. Putting everything in the bond is the most fiscally responsible way to do it. If we're going to use our capital reserves one way or another, using them to pay down part of the um, bond in order to lower the tax impact is the best way to use the money that we have. Um, it is absolutely the most fiscally responsible way to go forward uh, and set us up for the next 20 years. Um, and like Mr. Garrison said, yes, everything is going to be um, at least 20 years, right? So everything that we do is going to last at least 20 years and it's gonna lower maintenance. Um, we're not gonna have to re-up a lot of these things. So I just wanna reiterate that I really would go for the entire thing. Um, there's a large segment of the community that is willing to um, stand behind the entire thing and push for that in the community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beth. Anybody else in the audience? Okay. Uh, Mr. Yaris, online. Hi, um, Yoni Yaris, uh, Cherry Hill. I apologize, I'm holding the youngest learner to be in Cherry Hill who will be graduating in 2040. So if you guys noisy, I sincerely apologize. But my comment is based on that. I will have a student in the district when this bond hopefully comes due and totally being done. I agree with Beth, I agree with Andy, and I agree with Anne that we have to go for it all. We've seen the reaction. I was a student in the last bond and it got kept getting kicked. I didn't think when I was a student then that now with kids in the district myself, we would still be trying to pay for things that were needed 25 years ago. That we have to say the buck stops here. Um, to Mr. Garrison and your team, I have to say you're brilliant. Uh, to come up with the idea of utilizing the capital reserve to pay down debt is absolutely brilliant and just shows the board did an excellent job when they chose to go in your direction uh, when they went back to the drawing board for the bond after the last one failed. And I just want to say thank you that you have done absolutely everything. And I'm excited to see you go out and help build the campaign structure for this to be passed. Um, I agree with Beth that there is nothing fluffy in this at all. Um, we were well past the fluff. There's, this is just things that have to get done in order to get things done. So I behoove the board members to go for it all. I agree with Mr. Rorio that I'd be interested in seeing if we put $6 million down or more than just the $3 million that are proposed to reduce the debt. So just, I think when you go back around the table tonight, I think we need to go for it all. So thank you very much. 
Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Alana, Alana Yaris, Terry Hill. I was waiting for him to speak. Um, as the parent of six kids uh, in who will all eventually be in this district, uh, having my oldest who will live through the construction projects uh, if this bond is approved, whereas my youngest will benefit from all of those construction projects, I can't see in 18 years from now, not having done everything that needs to be done so that when my youngest graduates, he's not suffering through the same projects that my husband as a student in the district also had to suffer through. And now some of my children will not reap the benefits of that. Um, so I just think it's super important that everything is looked at so that it's all approved so that in 20 years when we come back for another bond because you know eventually we'll come back for another bond we're looking at things to fix or do that we didn't have to look at now instead of trying to fix things that now will be 50 years down the line instead of just 20 years down the line and the previous speaker had a baby making noise. So now I'm going to leave. So thank you all for this wonderful meeting. I have to go take care of my baby. <laughs> thank you. Um, next, uh, Mr. Jacob Graff, your turn. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, nice to hear from you again. It's Jacob Graff, class of 2020, uh, former Board of Ed representative. Maybe you all remember me. Um, I'm here to speak about the land lights and stadium improvements and kind of their de-emphasis in the bond. I think they should be emphasized as much as possible. Um, East has a culture problem that is a lack of enthusiasm for the school and to be a part of it. Um, I think the easiest way to counteract that is to have Friday night football games under the lights. I mean, West has them and they're awesome. It creates a culture that people appreciate their school. People want to be a part of it and they're ingrained in it. And simply put, we don't have that ability because we don't have lights and we don't have a big stadium. So there's that easy solution. I also don't really understand why it's not a priority if one school has it already and the other school simply doesn't. Like we, we need to have a balance, we need to have it equal. equal. And I think it's only fair that if West, if West has a lights in a stadium, then East should have lights in a stadium. But I also think that the fact of the matter is that while East can play games under the lights at West, East students don't want to have to go to West to play games under the lights. That doesn't make sense. It's a big burden on students. And I can imagine how much students would appreciate the fact that they could go to their school at night, 8 p.m., game under the lights, appreciate it, and, and then have the weekend to relax, come back to school and be rejuvenated by a big football win that previous weekend. And, and then they go back to school excited and happy to be there. Whereas now we go to West for our games and it's like three games a year, maybe at maximum. And so I just don't really understand why it isn't as big of a priority as it seems like it is to the board at the moment. Um, I really do think that it should be a much larger priority and have a much larger focus and emphasis. Um, and that's pretty much it. So thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Um, anybody else in the audience? If not, we're gonna get to, uh, I guess it's the, our turn now to give our consensus. Okay. All right, that will um, that will end the public comment session with no one coming to the mic or raising their hand online. And so, I guess I guess we're going to return to a sense of the board, um, given some really good perspective for our public comment. Would anyone like to start? Go ahead, Ms. Arroyo. So I'm in favor of supporting the full bond and increasing our capital amount. Um, reserve added to it. So I'd like to see what the numbers look like around that. But after visiting all the schools and getting the feedback from um, sitting through what Garrison and his team identified along with the parents and even the adjustments to West and even some of the conversations today, um, we need this to happen in our district. And I, I, ha I, I grew up in a family of construction workers and I understand development and we cannot bypass this opportunity. Um, it looks like a lot, it looks like a lot of work and I'm super excited about it being 
a three to four year process to go do this. But I also am thinking about everybody that's going to be able to benefit in 20 years down the line and looking at it differently. So I'm full support of all the projects and then increasing the capital amount and what that looks like. Thank you. Dr. Root? Um, I feel obligated to, to weigh in on, um, just looking at the F-wing map and the, the proposed F-wing map. In the old, old map, there's an electronics lab, drafting, journalism, art, uh, some physics stuff, an auto shop. So an awful lot of the arts in there. In the proposed, there's a couple of science labs and a lot of just uh, looks like uh, bland uh, or standard classroom space and STEM. Uh, I would like to know what, what we're gonna do to maintain some of those obviously programmatic rooms that uh, are important for the arts. Um, I think that is important to address. Um, uh, what, aside from that, I, um, I think one of the most uh, salient comments I heard in the public comment was that the cost and the issues are only gonna go up. Um, I did a brief stint as a carpenter, carpenter once upon a time and remember opening up some roofs and seeing ants, uh, carpenter ants taking away the rafters. When you let, stu let stuff sit too long and you let it rot, you end up paying two, three times as much as you intended. I think that it's really important uh, and, and the team of, of architects and the bo previous board have spent an awful lot of time determining what the most important projects are. Um, and I think it would be really, really, really important for us to, uh, to get all of that done because I agree, cost and issues only go up, they never go down. Thank you. Mr. Avadia, yeah. I'm sorry, it's Barbara Wilson. I'm being timekeeper again, I apologize. It is 8.50. 10 minutes until nine o'clock. Thank you. Okay. Be brief, everybody. <laughs> no, no. I mean, uh, we, we could we could take an extra a couple minutes because Dr. Malash is going to be brief. He already told me superintendent comments. He's, he's good. Ms. Friedel. Um, So I uh, support all the projects. We have let things go. We have to address them. We have to address them for the future. We need to address them uh, for those students who will benefit, for those who will be alumni, and for those who will come later. Um, every one of them is important in its own right. And, you know, it is a lot of money. I'm not going to say it's not a lot of money, but it's all necessary. And I, I just think it, we did due diligence, and Mr. Garrison and, and the team, um, I think, really, really listened and looked and have presented to us what is needed. Thank you, Ms. Stern. Try, try to capture it all. So I, um, I remember being here before the last bond and sitting in this room for the first time I ever saw the initial presentation. And I, I literally, my heart just sank to see how much work needed to be done. And here we are all these years later, um, it's only, some of it's gotten worse, although with some of the capital reserve projects that, that I think we've been, this district's been very fiscally responsible to take care of, we, we've actually addressed, um, tried to address some of these issues as we, as we go along. So, uh, you know, I, I went to probably eight or 10 meetings. Um, fiscal responsibility was a, a definitely a topic and a theme. Um, there was also a lot of theme of supporting the entire bond, um, which kind of surprised me. Um, I like all of the adjustments that have been made as a result of, um, to this original plan, as a result of all the community input, I like the fiscal responsibility being addressed. Um, it was truly exciting to, to get that information, um, the creativity. I think there's even more that we wanna to continue to do to make sure that we take all that community feedback. Regarding this specific, um, what, what's on the table for tonight, I, I differ a little bit in that I think there are a couple of places that I, I think are areas I don't know that I would be fully on board with. Um, and because I wanna really look closely at all the work we're doing and proposing. 
Um, I, I don't know, and this is maybe a little bit of a question, do we, if we actually need to create six new all-purpose rooms at $26 million, it's a lot of money. Um, I also can tell you that I, in the, when I was at the meeting at Kilmer, there was a very clear uh, opinion by parents who attended that meeting that there was an absolute need for a, an entrance, a new entrance area with um, which I equate as a vestibule. But I don't know that I support that for the other schools. Um, so I think, you know, moving forward with that where it's needed, and, and I know Kilmer was one of the schools, and I, I'm, I wasn't at all the elementary meetings, um, but I don't know that I would support that. And, and I know, Mr. Garrison, I'm going to offend you when I say this. I, at $800,000, I don't know that I agree with the, the monument LED lighting. <laughs> I, I think it would be beautiful. But if we can cut several million dollars out of this, and then I am in support of the idea of going for a full, the full amount, especially with the debt servicing and perhaps increasing debt servicing, because we hopefully won't need to do as many projects, I'm fully on board with that. So I'd like to, I'm cherry picking a little bit and pulling some things out is the way I look at this but ultimately going for the full amount. And I am 100% behind what we decide as a board. Um, so I just wanna put that out there. Thank you. Thanks, Mrs. Tong. I'm gonna make it very brief. Um, I am in favor of the bond. The only uh, thing that I, a little concern is, um, I think this, maybe we can, talk, uh, a few of the things that may not be necessary, maybe we can look look back, uh, scale back on it. But other than that, I think our students deserve every best school environment and safety. So I'm in favor of what, whatever we have to do to make this bond pass. Thank you, Mrs. Elmore Stratton. Uh, yes, I was just looking up, um, you know, uh, some of the developmental assets for young people to thrive and survive. And one of those is having a, a school environment that is clean, safe, nurturing, um, and has caring folks that they can identify. So I, I think we got the caring folks down and we'll, we will keep adding over the years, but I think we've done a disservice by not taking care of the buildings as well and, and still demanding of our teachers and administrators to do top quality work with while, while they have rooms where they can't breathe or, or you know, roofs that are leaking onto them. So I would be full support of a full bond and um, definitely we would go with the team in terms of wanting to look over some pieces that maybe can be removed as not necessity, but I think that we need to move forward and uh, get, a, get us past the, the last 25 plus years of the same buildings. Thank you, Mrs. Fleischer. Thank you. Um, I am in support of a full bond. I think our district is in desperate need of many things. And I think that Mr. Garrison and um, the rest of you did a wonderful job uh, helping explain everything. Um, I really believe that this bond is for our children. I believe that the children now, that is you know, why we are, sit on this board. They're our most important um, focus, and I believe the children in the future, which this is also for, because it will make our school something to be, our schools something to be proud of. Um, it will be bringing us into the next century, like we talked about. Um, so I am very excited to actually support this bond. Um, um, some of the comments that my other board members made, um, I am, you know, willing to look into, like using additional capital reserve, you know, being creative about different things. But um, I really, truly support this bond. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I've learned a lot at this meeting. Um, and I, th I think there's, there's clear direction. And I'm, I'm going to just say what I think that clear direction is and try to figure out if I've captured it. I don't hear anyone talking about two questions. So I think we're looking at one question. I think we're looking at the large plurality of one, two, and three. If there's stuff looking at it that you think can be shaved, Let's shave it. If not, we have support to go for everything. Uh, and we want to look at a modeling, I believe, Mrs. Sugars, that would take into account a greater theoretical commitment um, to annual movement out of cap reserves. That's what this board, from what I'm hearing, can get behind. And I certainly would join my colleagues to get fully behind it. 
Um, so Dr. Malash assembled um, experts as a sugars as a team. Does this give you enough for next week? I, I would say yes. Thank you. Um, thank you for the board comments. And, and Mr. Vadi, thank you for uh, pulling it all together and, and summarizing it. All right, before I go to official superintendent comments that I'll stay as long as you need, Dr. Moore. <laughs> um, but I did wanna take a moment to thank all those who expressed interest in our open board seat. Um, for those paying close attention, we are a member short. Um, I will say that any one of the 14 applicants that expressed formal interest would certainly bring great experience and points of view on a variety of pressing issues before this current board. Uh, now, from a process perspective, tomorrow, Mrs. Sugars will reach out to each applicant to indicate uh, who will and who won't be joining us next week for interviews. That will take place in public. Um, we look forward to continuing the process to fill our ninth board seat at this table. I will tell you a decision um, is scheduled for next week. That board member will be seated on February 8th. And with that, I turn it to Dr. Malash. Thank you, Mr. Avadia. Uh, again, one last time, let me, let me thank our professionals uh, for being here this evening. Uh, Mr. Notley, Mr. Garrison, Mr. Salamini, uh, and Ms. Tracy uh, for taking the time to, to be here. Um, and a special thank you to the people that called in and that were here in the audience to share their perspective. Um, and to all of the people that gave their perspective throughout the course of the last five months as we've had the discussions uh, and certainly over the course of the last five or six years uh, when we started these, these talks seriously. If you remember back to the Cherry Hill 2020 work that we did back in 2016 uh, is when we started those discussions. Um, so I'm grateful to everybody that, that spent the time. The presentations that were delivered this evening um, really is the culmination of, of literally thousands of hours of work uh, the professionals that are here in this room uh, and folks that aren't in this room, you know, that they've done to prepare this information. Um, I'm grateful for the board's support, uh, for the board's understanding and, and for the questioning. There's a level of authenticity that exists in the types of questions and the depth of the questioning that comes from the board to really get at the heart of what's gonna take place and to represent specifically the needs of the students in a way that is responsible for all the members of the community. And that's not lost on any of us in terms of where we are in this process. Uh, to the people that did make comments and that, that still have questions, um, I also ask that people look at the big picture and continue to look at the big picture of where, of where we are. There will certainly be individual parts of the project or individual parts of the referendum that individuals may not like, a, a small piece or an individual part uh, when it comes down through the discussion. Um, where we need to be as a community is at that consensus about what it is the best that we can do for our children, for the 11,000 that are enrolled in our district right now, uh, and for the thousands that aren't even born yet, will be attending our schools you know, over the course of the next 20 years. Um, that's our responsibility, and that's the perspective I think that we need to continue to have. Um, so I thank you. Um, there really is, is nothing, I don't think there, there's anything specific uh, truly to respond to, to any of the comments, other than to thank the people that were here this evening and online uh, to participate. Please make sure that you tune in next Tuesday night or join us here in the all-purpose room, the administration building for the next meeting. It truly will be an historic evening uh, as the board votes to approve the projects that will be submitted to the state uh, for the referendum. So thank you again, Mr. Vadi. Thanks for the time. All right, thanks so much. Um, we will not be going into a second executive session. However, board rem members will remember that we're taking a picture. Yay. And uh, with that, any motion to adjourn for the evening? We'll take it from Mrs. Stone. Second. Ms. Friedel. All right, we're adjourned. Thanks. <laughs>